again, just we're so glad that you're here on a beautiful summer morning. And I'm just glad that we live in such a wonderful place. I am just so thankful that we have a family like you people that we can come here and, and worship today. Just some reminders, don't forget following the service downstairs. We do have our Sunday school. Tuesdays are free swim. Please join us for that. Also, Wednesday night, we're going to be finishing up on the book of Philippians, and so please join us. We have such a great group and great conversation and just feeling the spirit of God as we talk and learn more about what the Bible has given us and how it can change our, our lives. Uh, just last Wednesday was just a wonderful Wednesday because prior to our Bible study, um, Evelyn, Evie, uh, was baptized, and so we added a new member to the family. <laughs> and also just uh, to thank, you know, God again, you know, Shelby and the youth group are back safely from their trip all the way to Cleveland, uh, Tennessee, and so, and she brought her grandmother with her as a... <laughs> <laughs> is to, to help and chaperone and that I thought is just the best ever and so that's great we're glad you're back so we're starting a series we started it last Sunday we're going to continue with this series it is called contend for the faith today we're going to talk about the true word and if you'd like to follow along our key scripture today is Jude 1 uh, again verses 3 through 8 and last week I said that we're going to make one statement and we're going to make it through, say it over and over as we go through this series, which says we don't have to apologize for our faith. We don't need to rally to God's defense. Our God is bigger than we are and he doesn't need us to defend him. But God still calls us to contend for the faith. He calls us to stand up boldly and declare what we believe in and to stand firm against any false teachings and so one of the tools that we have to help us contend with the faith is the Bible and it's important that we understand that and so we're going to talk about that today there's a story of a man who was on an airplane going on a trip and as he sits down he sits next to a, a young girl who is traveling by herself and as they took off, the girl, the young girl pulls out her Bible and starts reading it. And the man sitting next to her, who was an atheist, kind of smirked at her a little bit and looked at her and says, do you really enjoy reading this book? And she says, yes, I love reading God's word. And then he mentioned, what about that story about Jonah and the whale? Seriously, um, do you really believe that? And the girl said, yes, I really do. He said, how can you explain that a fish would swallow the man? And the little girl says, I have no idea. I don't know. I guess I'll have to ask Jonah when I get to heaven. <laughs> and the man says, what if Jonah is not in heaven? And she said, then you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Spurgeon once said this, and I love what he said. He said, defend the Bible? I would just as soon defend a lion. Just turn the Bible loose. It will defend itself. It's a powerful book, and it's our main weapon when we defend our faith. And because the power of Scripture has us to do this, one of the things I've discovered over the years is there's a lot of people out there are doing everything they can to quiet the Bible down, to undermine or undermine the Bible, to try to get people to think of other things. God's word gets in the way of things because they don't like what the Bible has to say. I want to go back a little bit and talk about the book of Exodus. And I know everybody knows the story of Moses and everybody pictures Moses looking like Charlton Heston. And in that part of the movie, Charlton Heston comes off of Mount Sinai after getting the Ten Commandments. And as he comes down off the mountain, he sees that they are sinning and they're against God. And so he's mad, God's mad, and he takes those tablets and he throws them down and he smashes them. 
Now, I always thought about this. He was mad that they were breaking the law. But they didn't have the law yet. <laughs> so what could he be mad at? But if you really read the scripture, if you really get into the scripture, you realize that before he goes up, God had come down. And God came down like thunder and like a ton. And was telling the people the laws. They knew the laws before he went up. They knew what God wanted, but they didn't, it hurt their ears when God said, and they finally, here's the Reader's Digest version, and just say, hey, Moses, we go up there and get that for us, because we don't like the noise, we don't like what God is saying. And so he goes up, and things hasn't changed in the last 4,000 years. People still can't stand to listen to God. <coughs> So they come up with their own ideas, thinking that they know more than the Bible. They think that I'm going to tweak the Bible because it's going to fit my lifestyle. I'm going to twink it, tr just turn it a little bit because you hear things. Well, everybody is going to go to heaven if you're good. That's just like tearing a little bit of the Bible out. Wait a minute. That's not what the Bible says. Or they'll say, once you become a Christian, you're saved by God's grace. It doesn't matter what you do anymore. You're good as gold. That's not what the Bible says. They said, there are many ways to heaven. Many paths to God. Find the path that's just going to make you happy. That's not how it works. Baptism, that's just something you do. It's not essential. It don't, that's not what the Bible says. Now, why would these people say these things? Why do people change these things? They change these things because they want to cover their sins. They want to feel good about themselves. And sometimes the Bible doesn't allow you to feel good about yourself because you know you're doing something wrong and the Bible says you're doing something wrong and you need to change because the Bible says so. There's people cutting parts of the Bible all the time. They want to change it for their own life. Now, I can understand when an atheist is trying to do it because they really don't care about God anyways, and it really means nothing to them. But I have a real problem for those who believe in the Bible, those who say that they're Christians, but yet they still want to cut out certain parts of the Bible because it doesn't fit their lifestyle. Or we can do just what Thomas Jefferson did. You can go to Smithsonian Institute and you can see the Jefferson Bible. What is the Jefferson Bible? He cut out sections of the Bible because it didn't fit his lifestyle. He cut out sections of the Bible because it couldn't make sense to him. And so he had his own Bible that he created. But the problem is, many Christians are following in his footsteps. Kind of doing the same thing. And I call some of these folks thread pullers. <coughs> You ever have a thread on something, you start just keep pulling it and keep pulling it, and pretty soon you don't have really anything left. Why do these people do that? And like I said, it's because of either sin, it's either because of pride, or it's because they have some kind of doubt. And they almost get kind of like smug about it. And sometimes that frustrates me just a little bit. But why? Why do they do these things? Because everything we know, and why does it frust me? Because everything we know about God and what he's done for us is in that book. Everything we know about what God expects of us and how he works in our lives is in that book. Everything we know about Jesus and what he said and what he did, from the words from him, from coming here and living the life, dying for our sins, his resurrection. How do we know all these things? Because it's in the book. And if I can't rely on part of the Bible to be trustworthy, there's certain parts that I'm questioning, then how can I trust any of it? I do know that Jesus was really who he said he was. And I know Jesus really died for our sins. And I know really he rose from the dead. Now, these thread pullers often pass themselves as responsible believers as they create doubt in so many people's minds. 
Because if you're not sure in the word, then it's very difficult to know. And it creates doubt because unless you get into the word, this is what I love about these people here. You people, this congregation, the elders, the deacons, and these people. Because if there's a question, let's turn to the Bible and find the answers. I don't know all the answers. They don't know it. But together we can find all the answers if we search the scriptures and let that be our guide. You see, we need to understand as contenders of faith the uniqueness of the Bible that we have, the uniqueness of the book that we all have. It's funny, I used to say that in class teaching. And I teach when I was teaching uh, Old Testament, Hebrew history. I look at them all going, y'all probably got a Hebrew history book at home. Go, well, why would I have a Hebrew I said, well, you got a Bible sitting somewhere? Well, yeah, you have a Hebrew history book then. You have the word of what we're doing. And he went, well, I never thought of it that way. And so I love what Webster, Webster must, you knew he had God within him when he was writing this dictionary. Not a good read, but a lot, there's a lot of good words in there, but uh, <laughs> I don't even know if anybody's got one of those anymore. <laughs> and how old is it? <laughs> yes, me too. But I like what the definition for unique says. One and only, single. Different from all others. Having no equal. This is the definition that Webster gave. So, as we look at the uniqueness of the Bible, I want to look at some different characteristics. What makes this Bible so unique? The Bible is unique because there is no equal. No equal. The Bible is unique in its composition. If we look at it, I mean, this blows my mind sometimes. It was over a period of 1,500 years it took to write this book. It was written in three different languages. It was written on three different continents. It was written by over 40 different writers from all walks of life. Kings, military leaders, poor, poets, fishermen. Prophets, statesmen, priests, scribes, scholars, shepherds, fig pickers, even an IRS agent that worked for the government, all took part in writing this book. This Bible was written in so many different places. Moses wrote it, some in the wilderness. Jeremiah was in a dungeon. Daniel wrote his part in a, in a palace. Paul was behind bars. Luke was traveling. John on an island. The Bible was also written during different moods, if you look at it. Some wrote from the heights of joy. Others wrote it from the depths of sorrow and despair. Some wrote during times of certainty and conviction. And others wrote days of confusion and doubt. And the Bible was written in a wide variety of literary styles. In this book, we have poetry. In this book, we have songs. In this book, we have romance and law. In this book, we have prophecy, historical narratives, parables, allegories. This book covers it all. There is no book like the Bible in composition. The Bible truly stands alone. And I challenge anybody, please, anybody to find a book that was written over a period of that many years by that many different writers in that different in any different language and yet and here's the key fits so perfectly together the unity of this book is amazing over that kind of period of time the bible is unique in its circulation you know it's not unusual to hear somebody's got a bestseller out there it's kind of cool there's a bestseller and if they can get 500,000 copies it's wonderful. If they get to a million, it's kind of rare. But I like this about the Bible. There's been over six billion of them sold. That's six, 60 to 100 million each year. It is the most published book ever. The Bible is unique in its survival. Attempts to destroy this Bible has always been part of its remarkable history. In the year 303, the Roman Emperor Diocletian put an edict out and said, I am going to destroy Christianity completely. And this awful persecution went across the Roman Empire, one of the most brutal in its history. And towards the end, 
Diocletian said, I want a monument built. And on the monument it reads these words. The name Christian has now been extinguished. 25 years later, Diocletian was dead. Constantine is now the emperor. Christianity is now legalized. 50 Bibles were ordered to be printed by the cost of the government itself. You can't kill it. I uh, like in 1776, Voltaire, one of the great French philosophers, he said within 100 years, he was in 17, he said within 100 years, there will be no Bible left in the world, but maybe in a museum. Very shortly after his death, his house was used to print Bibles. Exactly 100 years after his death, a copy of one of his first edition works that Voyer did sold for 11 cents. A manuscript of a Bible sold for a half a million dollars. You can't get rid of it. Peter said, all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. For 1800 years has been trying to overthrow this book, and yet it stands today as a solid rock. It stands today as one of the greatest books ever written. It stands today, and its circulation continues to increase, and it's being, more, it's being loved more, it's being used more than ever before. If this book had not been the book of God, man would have destroyed it a long time ago. Emperors. Kings, priests, princes, rulers have all tried their hand to destroy it. They're dead, but the word lives on. As Matthew says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Bible is unique in its influence. The Bible is without doubt the most influential book that the world has ever seen. More pens, more brushes are put in motion that we can ever imagine. The Bible has influenced such great people as Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. I'm talking about three of the four Ninja Turtles <laughs> were inspired by God's Word. You look at the musicians that are out there from Bach, Beethoven. And if you look today, how much Christian music is spreading everywhere. We support Smile FM because of the Christian music. And it's amazing how much is out there. Thousands of thousands upon works and lyrics have been written because of the Bible. Not only has the Bible had great influence on the arts, but it also has influence on our walk of life. The Bible has influenced our government. It influenced the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The Bible influenced the signing of the Constitution. I love what this historian Philip Schaff described as the uniqueness of the Bible. This is his quote. He said, This Jesus of Nazareth, without money or arms, conquered more millions than Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Mohammed, and even Napoleon combined. Without science, without learning. He shed more light on things human and divine than all the philosophers ever. Without the eloquence of ever going to school, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since. Produced effects which lie beyond the reach of any orator or poet without writing a single line. He set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, more orientations, more discussions, more learned volumes, more works of art, songs of praise, than the whole army of great men in ancient and modern times throughout history. The Bible has even influenced great men in our own history. Abraham Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through that book. George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Napoleon said, the Bible is no mere book, but a living creature with a power that conquers all that oppose it. 
Patrick Henry said, the Bible is a book worth more than all the other books that were ever printed. Ben Franklin said, a Bible in every home is the principal support for virtue, for morality, and for civil liberty. And I did this one for you, Evelyn. Sir Walter Scott. <laughs> if you don't know, he's from Scotland. <laughs> Had to do this one. But when he was lying in his bed dying, he was a great author, biographer. His best friend, John Lockhart, was next to him. And his last words for Sir Walter says, read from the book. And his friend said, which book? Which Scott replied, there's only but one. The Bible. The Bible. And finally, the Bible is unique with respect to the claims people say it has on their lives. You know, people read books all the time. I know a lot of people got books in your life, you read them once, you put them away, or there they are, they look really nice. Everybody likes their shelves filled with books. But it's different for those who are serious about the Bible. Stacy, how many times have you read the Bible? Fourteen. Fourteen. Cover to cover. And going to do it again. Every year. Every year. That's amazing. You just start over and you do it again. How many people, if you read the Bible, you read a scripture, and wow, that's really helped me, and then you come back to it later, and it means something entirely different. It's amazing how the Bible can fit to where you're at. It's amazing how this book can alter the way we think. Because it's the Bible that can change relationships. It's the Bible that teaches us values. It's the Bible that gives us a view of eternity. Not many books seem to have that kind of effect on people. I want to go on record here. I trust the entire Bible. The entire Bible. If God were to write a book, it would be unique. Different from all others. Having no equal, as Webster says. This book has no equal. This book is so unique. I always like seeing this. I can be wrong, but the Bible is never wrong. Do you realize that's what Jesus believed? He believed that the Bible was never wrong. One of his last prayers he prayed, he said, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He went by the book. I love when he was tempted by Satan. And what was the words he'd always start with? It is written. Jesus didn't have to tell Satan that. Jesus could have said, hey, I believe this. Satan, I'm going to say this unto you. He could have said, Satan, in my opinion, this is what I think. He said, it is written. And we have to realize that he was trusting in the very book that you and I each have. Because it was written for all of us. You see, the New Testament drives down the point as well. 2 Timothy says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Peter, Peter wrote, For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Someone once noted this about the Bible, that the Bible has a marvelous single-mindedness and a unity of its message. And what is this message? It's a message that Jesus Christ came down and died for us because we were sinners. And through this Messiah, that was the plan, and it's written in the book, we have this. In addition, we look at the Bible because what is the Bible? We have 40 different authors over 1,500 years. It's claimed to be the word of God 2,700 times. It contains 300 fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus. They say if you took 10 of those, 10 of those, 
10 out of how many, the odds that that would happen with one person, I always love this, it is taking the state of Texas, filling it with quarters, six feet high, taking one quarter, putting an X on it, blindfolded somebody, says, you got one chance to find that quarter. That's the odds for 10. He fulfilled all of them. And I can't think of what the odds that would be. I'm sorry. I can't do it. Does not contradict one proven scientific fact. As I was reaching through this, it was amazing. Of all the things the Bible had said, scientifically, of what we need to do and stuff, they were doing it. It took us a long time, and people would turn to the Bible to finally figure this out. It does not contain one absolute contradiction has been the road map for thousands of archaeological discoveries. It has never been wrong once, and it just blew my mind watching the news this morning. I don't know if you saw that, but Oakland University is in the news because they sent their students to the Holy Lands there, and he said he used the Bible to find what he was looking for, and there it was. Over and over and over again. This is how it is. And most important, in this is the most important. It has transformed the lives of millions of people who loved its promises. Just to give you an idea how accurate scripture is, I don't know if you know the story of Jericho. This is a big one that historians like to throw in Christians' face because for a long time they couldn't find the city of Jericho. And in the whole story of Jericho, they said, no, it doesn't work that way. And as they studied it, and finally got to the idea that there was a city of Jericho, then they got into the idea that if anybody ever got into a walled city like that, you'd have to get some battering rams, you'd have to knock in the walls, force them in so you can attack this city. And you probably would put a siege on them first, let them starve them out, and that would take a long time. Scripture tells us that Jericho fell in seven days. The first day, they marched around it one time. Same on the second day, the third day, the fourth day, so on, until they got to the seventh day. On the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. Then the priests blew their horns, and the people shouted, and the walls came tumbling down. Now, when that happened, the people then rushed into the city. If you read the Bible, burned everything just as God commanded. For centuries... Historians said, no, that didn't happen that way. Then, back in 1920, they found the ruins of Jericho. They knew, just like it said, it was a double-walled city. They learned that the walls were destroyed by a violent convulsion, just like the Bible says. And if you think about it, the walls came in. If you were attacking a city, I mean, the walls fell out. If you were attacking a city, you push the walls in. Jericho's walls fell out. Which to them says, how could that be? Then they realize, they find that everything, it was like a huge fire there, which God commanded them to burn everything. Everything that the Bible said has been true. The Bible is more than just an accurate set of stories. In every word, it has a powerful influence on its people. The book of Hebrews says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and mouth. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God said much more. Even in the Old Testament, he said, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and make it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that gives, goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The Bible repeatedly, repeatedly presents itself as almost mystical, a mighty tool. It is so, so mighty, in fact, that again, like, like Sturgeon said, and we went, way ahead, well, where are we at here? That just turned the Bible loose, and the Bible will defend itself will defend itself. But the Bible can do more than that. Scripture has a power in its words to transform our lives. That is what's so important about this book. It can transform a person's life. I like this here. Charles Bradloff at the time was one of the leading speakers. He was an atheist. And what his big claim to fame was, 
is that he felt confident enough that he could embarrass anybody that was a Christian. And so he always wanted to debate him. Well, he picked the wrong guy in Hugh Price Hughes. And he said, I'll take your challenge. I'll do this debate. But this is what Hughes says. He said, I propose that we each bring some concrete evidence of the validity of our beliefs in the form of men and women who have been redeemed from their lives of sin and shame by the influence of your teaching. He said, I will bring 100 men and women, and I challenge you to do the same. If you cannot bring 100, he said, that lives have been transformed and changed because of your teaching, because I will have 100 there, just bring me 50. I'll be okay with that. I'll bring 100, just bring 50 that you can say their lives have been transformed by your atheistic teaching. He said, I'll tell you what, just bring 20. You know what? If you just, just bring me 10 to my 100. He said, forget that. Bring one. If you can bring one person whose life's been transformed and changed, then we'll have it. Charles Bradlaugh said, I don't want to debate you. And withdrew from the challenge. You see, that's the power of the book. That is the power of what we call the Bible. Everything we know about Jesus and his forgiveness and his mercy are found in that book. The words of scriptures are God-breathed and have the power to change lives from sin and shame into joy. There's no book that speaks to us like the Bible. No book that better understands human lives and human relationships than the Bible. In this book, in the Bible, we found out how to be better husbands. It teaches how to be better wives. It teaches how to be better parents. It teaches how to be better children. It teaches us how to be better friends. It teaches us how to be better people. In this book, we're taught how to control our anger. In this book, we're taught how to control our tongue. In this book, it teaches us how to control our money. In this book, the Bible, we will find God's purpose for your lives. Because this book is full of wisdom. But more importantly, this book is full of life. And it seems to know exactly what we need to have. It knows that we need joy. It knows we need peace and hope. It knows we need purpose for our lives. It knows we need freedom. So if you're going to contend for the faith, you have to realize that this is the book, that this is the Word of God. Now, as I said earlier, there are folks out there that just don't like our Bible. They oppose the Bible because of their sin or their pride or their doubt because it condemns their lifestyle. I love the story of W.C. Fields, if you know him. And one day, a friend of his walked into his dressing room in W.C. Fields, was reading the Bible. And his friend, you know, Fields, you know, was a notorious sinner. That was his lifestyle. And his friend said, whoa, what are you reading? He looked up his friend and said, I'm just looking for loopholes. <laughs> just looking for loopholes, because what does the book of Jude say? For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you, they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license of morality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign Lord. People pervert and reject the scripture because of their pride, because it doesn't fit their lifestyle. See, opposing God, I like the, the big dog in the universe, allows them to create a following. This is what they want to do. I'm going to question God. I'm going to make God not seem right because if their biggest thing is if you don't read it, I got you. And a lot of professors in a lot of our secular colleges don't like it when there's a Christian in their classroom because they will question. Because these professors, I want to control your mind. I want to change your whole thought process. See, Paul warned of people like this. He said in Acts, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw them away from the disciples after them. 
You see, there's just some people who just don't trust God. You know, there are students I would talk to. They say, you know, Mr. High Street, I don't believe in God. This God. You know, I said, well, tell me about this God that you don't believe in, because I probably wouldn't believe in that one either, because you don't understand how big God is. Because in their minds, their God is not big enough at all. In their minds, their God could not create the world in seven days. Their God's not big enough to create a worldwide flood. Their God is not big enough to part the seas. Their God is not big enough to knock down walls of Jericho. Their God is not big enough to protect Daniel in the lion's den. Their God just is not big enough. You wonder if their God is even big at all because my God is surely big enough. My God is the one who came down from heaven. My God was so big, he sent his son to go to cross for our sins. My God is so big that he loves us so much because he said, that's what you need to understand of what I'm doing for you people. I'm giving you eternal life if you believe in me. If you repent of your sins, if you confess him as your Lord and Savior, if you become baptized in the waters here, he's saying, I got you. I got you. That's my God. I will not put him in a box because he's too big. My God is big. I believe all this stuff because it's in the Bible. And the sad part is that too many people reject the Bible because it contradicts itself. Not because of anything else. It contradicts them and what they're doing in life. The Bible is true. As I close out as Pam comes up, there's a story of a man called Tony Campolo. He was a preacher. He was also taught at a secular college. And one day as he finished a lecture, a student stood up and said, Dr. Campolo, you seem to be a real reasonable man. Seem like you know what you're talking about. How can you, with all this education, how can you, with all this sophistication, really, truly believe in the Bible? <coughs> and Tony said, it's easy. I decided to. He said, I have to explain. Once I decided that I was going to believe it, I spent the next 35 years of my life accumulating arguments to support what I already believed. My reason only came in afterwards. It only supported what I already committed myself to. The more I dug into it, the more I read it, the more it convinced me this is the word of God. And he looked at the school. Before you try to say anything, before you get nasty with me, I got to ask you a question. Why don't you believe in the Bible? Is it because you just decided to? Please, please, he said, please, if you read it from cover to cover, then spare me. Don't give me this jazz that is full of contradictions because you can't prove one. This is the thing. Somewhere along the line, you decided not to believe, and after you decided not to believe, I know you must have been accumulating all kinds of ideas to support this commitment, like I did for 35 years. But I look at you, and I know you didn't. You just decided because somebody said something. You didn't get into the Word. And the kid looked at Compolo and said, you don't understand. For me to believe in God, I have to have a God that I can understand. And Tony Compolo looked at him and said, God refuses to be that small. You see, when you boil it down, most people's problem with the Bible it's not that it contradicts itself. It can now contradicts the way they live. You see? The Bible is just not another book. It is the book. And if God took the time to create this wonderful world, to put everything in place that it needs to be placed, to create who we are, that there's never been anybody like us. We're complete individuals. I love the guy that came up with the DNA, said the only explanation to explain this, there is a God. If God did all that, then you know that the whole Bible is true. You know about Jesus Christ 
you will learn about the cross. You will learn about the resurrection. You will learn about what it is to forgive. You're going to learn about heaven. You see? It is a powerful book. A powerful book. And we need to understand as contenders of faith, the Bible is our main weapon. We need to understand this is where we go to for strength. We need to go to it to help us each and every day. See, it's our main weapon. Why is it our main weapon? Because what does it do? It shows us God's love. It can show us God's grace. It can show us God's mercy. It can show us God's forgiveness. It can show us that believing in Him and accepting Him as our Lord and Savior, that He has a place for us in heaven. This is why this book is number one in contending for the faith. It's our job to share it. It's our job to be witnesses. It's our job to show others what we have. And we said, where did you get this? Let me show you the book. And let me share it with you. If you don't have a Bible, take one that we have out here. See me. We'll get you one. If you're questioning, man, I want to be part of this. I want to do what the Bible tells me to do. I want to be Christian. Well, this is the time. As we sing this invitation, search. If you're struggling with something, give it to God because he said so in the book. If you're struggling with people, find forgiveness. Why? Because it says so in the book. This is who we are. This is who we follow. This is why we're called the Church of Christ, because we follow Christ. Why? Because it's in the book. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.